Another Libertarian Crusaders podcast show, episode number 20. And today we're going to talk about Ayn Rand, objectivism. We have a special guest who helps runs the uh, local objectivist group here in Richmond, uh, Tom uh, DeSilva. Is yes. that right? Yes. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that there's uh, an objectivist presence here in Richmond. I want to first move here to Richmond 2009, 2010. I used to hang out with some objectivists here. I would say like my path towards... Um, was led to like anarcho-capitalism and all this stuff came from an objectivist background and reading all Ayn Rand books. And, uh, for a long time, I thought I was the only one cause it was like before like Facebook and everything. Uh, so I thought it was like, but it's kind of cool to see how that's kind of grown. And then you can see like all these YouTube debates on it. And it's uh, a wild place for sure for objectivism since I don't know, Ayn Rand's time, I believe. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into objectivism? I, uh, I was, uh, looking at books in a, in a bookstore, um, so I was looking for answers in the political area and, um, and I was hitting also in the philosophy section cause I figured that would go a little deeper. Right. And, uh, I picked up, uh, Aristotle and Plato and, uh, a, uh, uh, existentialist reader, which included some Nietzsche. And then I picked up, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, virtue, virtue of selfishness, or maybe it was capitalism. I think capitalism and ideal was the first one I picked up. And, uh, when I read that, it was, it was, it was impressive. I mean, it was kind of mind blowing because it, it kind of shattered all the molds and, uh, kind of pretty much read everything else since then. This was, uh, back in, let's say 89 mm -hmm. around that time frame when I was just kind of getting out of high school or maybe just finishing up high school. 87 to 89, that time frame. No, so you've been, you've been, uh, studious <laughs> since of achieving, uh, objectivist Zen by now, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, once your, your intellectual, um, appetite has been peaked, you, um, don't stop there. You do right. other things and, uh, really enjoyed, uh, Max Stirner and, uh, uh, Bohm, uh, on quantum, uh, what he calls it, uh, quantum mechanics and, uh, and, you know, just lots of other things really. <laughs> All right. How would you define, uh, objectivism? How would I define it? Um, or how is it defined? Well, the short, short, shortest answer is probably, you know, the philosophy for living on earth. You know, it's, it's the idea that, um, that a philosophy and and ethics that that are that's derived from the philosophy should be um geared towards uh running a productive and uh uh what's what's the word prosperous uh, prosperous uh yeah. you know a fulfill fulfilling life because it's really why we're here is we're alive and and, and you should make the most of it because only one shot at it really right <clears throat> Uh, but I mean, if you want a more, uh, a little bit more deeper answer, it's going to be, you know, uh, you got metaphysics, um, existence exists and, uh, existence is, um, independent of your consciousness. Um, but consciousness also exists and, and, uh, these things, um, are, are axiomatic. So it's, it's like, it's pre proof because you have to at least admit these before you can move beyond that and have, even have any kind of rational discussion. So, you know, the, that, that reality exists, that, um, that you exist and you're able to experience reality in some, in some way, right. Uh, through the senses, we would say mm -hmm. <laughs> as objectivists. Um, so, uh, and moving from there, you go to, uh, uh, reason, which is your means of understanding, uh, reality, you know, taking in the, uh, the sensory perceptions and, um, making something meaningful out of them that you can use uh, in building uh, a base of knowledge. And, uh, after that you get to, uh, uh, I guess ethics. So you're, you're dealing with, uh, okay, now, now that we, we know that reality exists and, and that I exist and I don't want, and, and that we're alive, what are we going to do with it? Know, what do we do with all that? And that's what ethics is for. It's, it's not like a straitjacket to make you live by somebody else's rules. It's, it's how can I maximize my, um, 
enjoyment of my life, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that leads you to the politics because, you know, when you're dealing with people in society, you politics is, is that branch of philosophy that deals with um, interaction, human interaction in a, in a uh, uh, social setting, basically. Um, and then on top of that, you'd get aesthetics, which uh, also uh, is as useful, I guess, and enjoyment. You know, tells you what is real art. Exactly. Yeah, so. A banana tape, duct tape. Cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Did you hear about that? There's an installation somewhere out there. Someone paid one hundred twenty thousand dollars on auction. It's just a banana duct tape to the wall. Uh, and that's it. That's the installation. And someone paid $120,000 for the certificate that goes along with it. Someone, however, just the other day, um, did a uh, walking installation, right? A living art piece. That he entitled it The Hungry Artist and took the banana and ate it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Somebody accused them of uh, trying to launder money with that purchase because $120,000 huh, for a banana taped to a wall. Yeah, that's just money laundering. <laughs> <laughs> Some drug dealer had it. It does sound a mite suspicious, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> then again, some of these people in the art world are very gullible. So, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Anne Rand herself was very uh, into like the theater arts. I think she did a really yes. good job. Yes, uh, the theater, the theater, uh, because it combines so many of the arts um, uh, with the all the stage settings and all that. You've got plastic arts and then you've got um if you, if, you, if you do like an opera for example you're talking you know the plastic arts the uh dance music um or literature all of it i yeah. mean it, mm -hmm. it's really a kind of an all-encompassing even to some extent architecture <laughs> yeah right you know? yeah uh in that famous book the fountainhead um with howard work uh we'll get into that later some people will call it it's a story about ip terrorism uh, because hard work destroys, uh, the building and the property belongs to someone else. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think she's done a remarkably well coming from Russia and having to learn English and having to make something out of herself from nothing and having all these experiences of ills of communism and how was, that life is like in that philosophy or lack of ethics or, um, the, for the sake of altruism, um, I guess you can sum that up as like, what do you think of then of like the consequences of uh, altruism versus selfishness? Right. Yeah. The consequences of altruism, you can pretty much see it um, in a lot of places where, where you look, where, it, where it's, where it's uh, been rampant and uh, it's basically a, you know, rivers of blood and <laughs> destruction and starvation and privation. I mean, disease, pestilence, what have you. I mean, it's not good. Not a pretty picture. All right. Uh, and, and the way that they define it is like you have to do it for this is like JFK speech, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country uh, is always uh, what you can do for uh, the state, you know, for uh, the, the mystical creature, the Leviathan or for, for others. Right. Exactly. Um, never for yourself, not for your family, not for like media group, but for the collective. Um, I think. Uh, I guess that kind of differentiate because some people will say, well, you know, it means that they don't want to do any good, you know, because they're selfish. There's a way that they've hijacked that term selfishness to mean bad. Uh, your self-improvement is a bad thing. Well, I always ask people the difference between selfishness and self-centered because I think self-centered is bad, but selfish is fine. All right. Yeah. I, I don't even, I, I wouldn't even say self-centered is bad. What I, what I, I would say that, uh, that, when it's when it goes bad, it's because you've um, misunderstood your values hierarchy as a selfish person, and you you're devaluing something that um, really ought to be higher value in your higher hierarchy, and and that's why that's why for example maybe you you've um, you know beating your wife for example or something like that you know I mean that's that's a, a, a misallocation of of values. It's the, uh, you know, you can see somebody driving like a Porsche or something to, to me, I think like, uh, or you look at this person with a fancy car or something like that. And somebody might say, well, that's person selfish because they spent all this money on this thing that, you know, people in poor countries would just, that, that could feed their entire country or something. Uh, but 
what they, I think what a lot of people also fail to see is that there's all these people who benefited from that purchase too, that you just don't see. Right. And, and without intending to actually benefit those people, this rich person who buys the Porsche or whatever still does it. Right. Because I mean, when you buy something and it's truly a value to you and, and you, you exchange, make that exchange, then, and the person who sold it to you, it's, it's, it's a value for them to make the exchange. Then, then it's really a, a value gain on both sides. It's a, it's a positive, positive. And, um, you know, as, <clears throat> as far as, um, you know, balancing your own personal, um, happiness against, uh, what's happening with people you don't know on the other side of the world. I, I don't think that should really factor very highly into the equation because you don't know how those people have got into the search the situations they're in or why they're in those situations. And you're perfectly free to help them out if you like, but, but, uh, you're, there's certainly no obligation to. I think the, uh, my favorite quote is like, somebody was asking her, like, how do you, what do you think about the poor? And like, how do you help the poor? It's like, by not being one yourself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there's so many people who will go into debt and ruin their finances, helping poor people or helping people who, who ju- justifiably want help and are in dire circumstances. But, um, it, it is confusing. It's like, you can't give as you like the United States, you can't give foreign aid if you're already in massive amounts of debt. Right. So right. it's self-destructive. It's like that, um, Dr. Ben Hanning quote, when he goes to the moon where he's tired of being entanglement in the dramas of other people's lives. But sometimes these people kind of just do that and not kind of focus on themselves and, and their priorities and their virtues and their values. Um, they're just kind of pulled every which, which way. Um, and I think that's where objectivism is helpful. I think, uh, her book, the virtue of selfishness is a great starter. Mm-hmm. Uh, always recommended to everybody. Um, I think, uh, it, the At- Atlas Shrugged is the second most real read or sold copy right next to uh, the Bible. Yes, yes. Uh, that was uh, a 1992 poll, I believe it was. Um, All right. Second most influential book after, uh, you know, after the Bible. So, And yet feminists don't give her much credit. <laughs> <laughs> no, because um, while she was a strong woman, she was also feminine and feminists hate femininity. <laughs> yeah, not too hard to find cases of that. <laughs> um, you know, you think she she filled all the tenets of what feminists uh, would aspire every woman to do, right? Self taught, independent, mm-hmm. created great works of art. Uh, self made, really. Self made, you know? yeah. Uh, didn't have kids. Feminists love that, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. <laughs> And, I, and that's an interesting topic, too, because people like to talk about, well, well, I, I'm Rand hated kids. Right. It's like it's like, no, she thought that, that that having a kid was such an important thing that that you should only do it if you're really going to be committed to doing it. And she knew that she had a, a whole career to deal with and that she wouldn't be able to commit to having kids. So that's why she didn't do it. Not because she hated them. Mm. <laughs> And, and also not because she ate them for breakfast. That's funny. Right. <laughs> she, actually, she actually had to say that one time too. <laughs> I always imagine like Anne Rand waking up in the morning and uh, she goes to the mirror to start her day and she's got all this bed hair and she's like, that's irrational. <laughs> um, I hear sometimes somebody likes to talk like, that's irrational, don't do it. You know, rest rational, you do it. Um, I was curious about... Um, so back then, in, in a way, like even Milton Friedman pushed capitalism and this understandings to greater lengths. Uh, Milton Friedman will push it all the way down towards like, you don't need government involved in anything, uh, maybe in these small affairs, right? Uh, seems like Ayn Rand uh, came with the same similar uh, direction. Uh, production of security, uh, courts. Uh, I think that's sort of generally it in her interest, right? Basically, yeah, yes. National defense, domestic security, and, and the courts. Right. I'm sure if she was uh, continue to live, she'd probably philosophize even further away. Right. Um, it's not like uh, the stuff that we know today with like anarcho capitalism, like privatize everything was like a readily available piece of information or place to study. Um, so what do you think now uh, in terms of uh, grasping objectivism and picking up where she left off? Do you think the objectivism has pushed that further to privatize those areas too, where Ayn Rand uh, left off? Well, I think you, I think you still have to be careful about some of that. I mean, um, 
for one thing, I mean, like, sure, you could have um, like a arbitration for, for voluntary um, adjudication of, of conflicts and things like that. Um, but if you get to a situation where they where, where a, a resolution can't be reached, then you still need some sort of, I guess, a final arbiter. But um, and the other thing is, uh, if you're talking about, like, say, police force and military, uh, that gets I think that gets very problematic if you try to have um, the privatized military forces. Now, I'm I'm perfectly, for example, I'm perfectly OK with private um, uh, security forces. Like if somebody wants to hire a security detail or even a, a significant security force for his own personal protection, for protection of his properties, even around the world, it could be even very sizable, even rivaling, um, say, military forces of some countries. I, I don't have a problem with that, but they still have to be, um, I think they still have to uh, probably at least... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. About. Yeah, the because accountability yeah. is the problem. Because when you, get, when, I, I did this to myself. Because when you when you get international, now you now you're not now you're not dealing with one specific government. You're dealing with different and it's governments. the idea that uh, governments have no problem spending money on massive militaries because they have uh, tax revenue. Whereas right. the average individual is like, oh, this is a losing investment. You know, I'm, right. it's all expense. It's there's right. no assets. Right. right. Yeah, They're not making I, profit in the third years. Like we're just going to have to cut the CEO, you know, uh, downsize or something. Right? Yeah, I that's the last time the American military has downsized. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, they've had to do a little bit of belt tightening with this with this sequestration, but uh, not. I, I don't even know if there's really actual cuts as as much as just a, a drop in the increase. Moving. So, yeah. They also can't recruit people because the they've had to lower the standards so much. People still can't meet them. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Do you know Michael Malice? You ever follow him anything? Don't think I know that. He's a he's a huge fan of Ayn Rand, but he's today he's a uh, anar anarchist. He calls himself an anarchist, not well, an anarcho capitalist. I mean, but he's still a huge supporter of hers and talks about her all the time and uh, says glowing things about her. So now, admittedly, I'm, I haven't done a lot of reading in the anarchy um, area, and I'm curious. I mean, if there's a, even a consensus here on what do we mean by anarchy? Uh, well. All the services the government has monopolized, like USPS, the uh, ABC, uh, they have a monopoly that prevents market competition. Right. I want market competition in all these areas. Well, I, so so I that's what I mean by definitely agree. It. Uh, yeah. Anarchy. I mean, you know. Yeah. Well, well, well. I mean, but but how far do you go with that? That's that's the question. I mean, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, are you talking about privatizing the military and the? courts and the police forces or uh, I mean courts are just adjudication of uh, judgment opinions what's uh, the means of production if my own hands are the means of production I'll privatize everything I could be my own military I can hire anybody I want just like that you were thinking of just a minute ago you can have it internationally I if it, I, they have to no, be held no, accountable you when to, you put also, a government right, involved but, but they, just a just point of clarification you know mm -hmm. um, you have to also keep in mind that my position isn't necessarily 100% aligned with the objectivist position. But um, like I said, with the, with, the, with the military, I mean, how do you, how do you see that playing out, for example? Like, like uh, in, would, would, if, we, if, we, if we said like, okay, the United States is going to be a cap, uh, an anarchist, an anarcho-capitalist place. What, what does that look like to you? Does that mean? There was a point in time in history before the Federal Bureau of Investigation was created. Uh, there was another group, a private interest group that chased after bank robbers, uh, investigations. And so it started off the whole detective stuff and they were called the Pinkertons. At yes. one point in time, their armed security personnel had more people armed security than the United States military combined. And I'm fine with that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, so, so, I mean, for me, if I had my way, I would have the government arm militia groups. But then the quality of their guns, you know? Right. right. <laughs> there is that, right. It's there the monopoly on force, right? Like you were talking about uh, anybody can I mean, compete. It's kind of an extension of, 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 the, uh, of the military. I mean, it would be like, okay, which, which is really what the founders had in mind anyway, mm -hmm. an armed 
public militia, right? That would be the 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 main backbone of of your of your national defense. And and uh, you know, I think I mean Poland's doing it today, if I'm not mistaken. They 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 are arming militia groups in their country. You're absolutely right. People talk so much that we have a right to health care. Where's my right to a gun? Exactly. Government issue standard uh, M4. Right. Well, what's <laughs> exactly. I, I, again, it's like it's like the, the, there is that that line of okay, should the government actually be giving people anything? But in, in this case, it's like well, okay, if it's a if it's a, a it's a national security matter, I think that that you could argue that it that it, that you could do it. I mean, you know that that it would be an extension of your military spending to arm your, your, uh, populace. If they find that it's cheaper than having 900 bases all over the world, uh, <laughs> then I think right. that's a good direction right. towards, I mean, uh, if, every, freedom. If, if people know that, that pretty much everybody in your, in your country is armed, they're going to think twice about invading your country. And it's a further check and balance on the yeah. power of the government. I mean, you still, right. you still need, um, probably high level, uh, technologically advanced defense systems to protect against foreign, um, governments that have, nuclear weapons and long range capacity and things like that. I mean, certainly not, I don't think there's any way of getting around that. And all those, that, that's for me, that that's one of the fallback, uh, one of the downfalls of a, of, of a purely an, anarchy kind of system. How to, how do, how do you uh, address those sort of issues? You look at um, how the government addresses it now. They lost a nuclear uh, missile off the coast of Tybee Island in Georgia. Uh, it's just, it's just there. Yeah. Nobody knows where it is. The radio radiation still Oops. comes off. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, these other countries, I guess their incentive to nuke us is, well, we want to control that tax revenue. Like we want to conquer them. And if you're an anarcho-capitalist country, you become very difficult to um, take over because the average person isn't used to paying taxes, isn't isn't down right. to go serve another a new exactly. government after they exactly. just left the they're, they're, last one. Yeah. You really want to conquer to take over uh, the people who are already uh, under the influence of always paying taxes. Hitler wants to take over France quickly so he can take over the tax farm to keep you know things going. You conquer Afghanistan, there's no tax farms, you know, so <laughs> it always ends in uh, you know horrible ends for anyone who goes there. Right. Um, there's no exactly state <coughs> actors or people who are um, in the system to do it. Uh, so yeah, it's difficult to force then people to do something that they don't really have much of a history of doing. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, to your question, how do you solve that? Those questions, most of the military technology is not really created by the military. It's like North and grown up. Uh, oh, sure. yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that is already kind of privatized. Right. Yeah. I, I figure one and then we'll figure out. Side of it, <laughs> right. I was reading about, which is uh, good. I mean, you, we want the production side definitely to be privatized. I'm right. struggling with that topic because you know, if you love guns or shooting guns or whatever, you can quickly find out that a lot of your favorite guns were created because the government demanded them. And like during the cold war, some of the best rifles like the FN foul and the different guns like that, the government wanted them. And so that's why they're in such large existence. They're so, you know, they're so numerous today. And so you just wonder what type of guns would we have without government incentivizing how many guns, you know, would we have any, would people really need them? You know, I well, I would say that people in Europe have just learned how to make a gun from scratch using, cause Europe is a lot smarter about banning guns. They ban the parts that are actually hard to get instead of here. So these people have learned how to rifle barrels with a 3d printed jig and salt water and electricity. Wow. And then they can assemble their own, so <clears throat> the government will put restrictions on it, but then people will find their way around it regardless as well. So yeah, like it's malinvestment. Every time the government says, oh, this is the, the type of product we want. Well, first they have to rob from the taxpayers who are the ones that are gonna end up using the product anyway. So they get a substantially less quality product overall, really, I think. It's like the, um, the first moon mission is like, did we really need to go to the moon during that time? <laughs> well, that's, that's something that Ayn Rand exactly said is, is, uh, you know, if, if we had waited until, um, we were ready to do it, it would have happened anyway. And it would have been right. much, you know, cheaper, much cheaper. I imagine not, better so equipment. So it's not exploding. Elon Musk would be but given the today, fact that we instead. did it, yeah. it was still quite impressive, I guess. And I think she or did we? 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's Anne Rand's projection? Did we land on the moon? I, I think she was fairly <laughs> confident that we did. Um, so speaking of uh, guns in terms of protecting property rights and whatnot, uh, that leads us to the next topic, uh, intellectual property. Well, before we jump to Linda, yes. let, let, uh, not really a jump, but yeah. let me um, bring up one more point on, on um, protecting property. Um, <laughs> what about aspects, you know, again, going, going to how, how would an anarcho-capitalist system deal with this? Um, what about aspects where you have an actual criminal element, um, say a thief or a rapist or murderers or whatever? How would those be dealt with in an anarcho-capitalist system without a judicial system? Well, we want judicial systems. Kind of like when you go to an apartment complex, here are the things that's permissible. Uh, or you move into like a gated community and if there's things that you need to address or need to be adjudicated, they say like, this is going to be the third party that we go to, right? Or generally before you do that in an ANCAP system, you have multiple third parties so you can agree on the contract to adjudicate through, making sure that they're not tied in with that person. Uh, and then, you know, it can continue going further into like places we can appeal it to. Um, and at least this adjudication system will be far better in versus if you go to the state adjudication where the cop versus works for the state, the yeah. judge works for the state, the prosecutor works for the state. Nothing about this seems kind of impartial. Now, what, what would you say is the best for, for someone like me to, to read on that, to get a better handle on, on that kind of an idea, that system? Uh, David Freeman wrote a really good book called... Um, uh, or what you can call like radical capitalism, the machinery of freedom uh, does a really good encapsulation of all of this. He, I yeah. think, is a great, uh, so he calls it polycentric uh, legal systems. Uh, and he does a great research and a great amount of like multiple legal systems throughout history and how they worked uh, without yeah. the state. Well, and, I mean, you, you, one thing you, you, I, I keep in the back of my mind is, is that you, you already have in the world different, right, different um legal systems in different yeah that's right, right. Yeah. different di different jurisdictions as it were so <clears throat> um i haven't dismissed it completely but I, i'd be curious to read right. more about it you know you make a good point there, there are multiple polycentric legal systems well, already state, exist well, like yeah. uh, sharia <laughs> <laughs> probably a bad example to use around this crowd but uh <laughs> i mean to be fair both parties are, are like hey i'm a muslim i'm a muslim we agree to be adjudicated by this thing all right and you know re yeah. the rest of society doesn't have to worry. i'm not going to tell them they can't do it but <laughs> they're not going to force me into it right all right um, and you find in the private market, they do it faster. Your car insurance has already agreements with other car insurance agencies. And we don't want to spend forever in this. Uh, if this happened, this happened. We already have a pre-written way to kind of go about it um, to kind of pay each other out. What have you, yes. All right. Uh, so I find it to be faster, efficient, whereas like the court cases here drag on forever and cost so much. And uh, most often than not, they're not in, impartial. My personal opinion is the best way to deal with a thief or a rapist is by yourself. Just well, more guns. Yeah. Well, 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 Zap yeah. them on the spot. Well, on the spot, yes. But okay, so what if somebody breaks in your house when you're not there? Right. Then you put them down the and then you there. do the Fortnite dance over them. <laughs> <laughs> well, first you have to figure out who it is. Right. right. And you need some way to objectively get to that. But, you, you know, it's incentivized for crimes to be solved because we want to live in a peaceful, prosperous certainly, society. Certainly. So, uh, the, uh, like the gated communities, you, I would imagine just, I'd imagine there's going to be thousands of gated communities, gated cities, and they all have, um, their own security that they provide mm -hmm. and they have the promise to protect and provide for that security. And it'll be them that kind of responds to this. And then, uh, their core systems that they've already established. Um, as, as people think sometimes, uh, like this comes after it's like, all oh, this is pre-planned before they created right. uh, the gated community. There's and a, when government creates this sort of illusion of public trust, like public lands, uh, sidewalks where you can walk. And I think with a, with a private society, you would find that there would be a way to determine how much I should trust another person, like their credit rating, but covering more aspects of life. And, uh, you, you know, the insurance company example that David Friedman uses uses is a good one. You know, mm -hmm. you're less lower risk than the the other people. Yeah. You yeah. keep your promises, essentially. Certainly. And that's something that's an uh, aspect that we kind of want in an ANCAP society. Credit rating system is a good example of that. It shows that you promise to keep your word and your contracts. 
Um, yes, yeah, a consistent record of it. Basically. Right. Yeah. Which is. So you have a judge who says the same thing and no complaints. I've been in the system doing this for 10 years. Look at the common reviews, like any kind of service and product, five stars out of five stars. He looks like a good person to adjudicate this as a third party uh, judge. And I think that's kind of how we have more freedom to choose those kind of judges than <laughs> the ones we're stuck with. It has to default to the person that has to make the best choice for them overall. You, yeah. You're responsible for whatever course of action you take. <laughs> I think ties in really well with objectivism. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the, you know, one of the arguments against the capitalist, uh, anarcho-capitalist system is, is uh, put forth by Harry Binswanger, for example, is that, uh, that you'd have these competing um, security forces and what are they, are they gonna get into a shootout or something or, but uh, you know, if there's, if there's a way to do it without resorting to that, mm -hmm. then maybe, maybe that's doable, you know, right. but like I said, I need to read up more. Yeah, on yeah. Right. I think a lot of the private ones is that they're held personally liable for these sort of things, right? They're the, versus like the ones who at the shootout that just happened with the UPS driver is like, uh, no one's going to get fired for any of that. Nobody, nobody loses any money for that. UPS um, hasn't even made a statement as far as I know. No, they right? did, but they were like, thank you to oh, uh, blue line. Blue line. Yeah. Can we have a quick synopsis of that situation so everybody <laughs> knows what we're talking about? The um, so there were some jewel thieves who tried to rob a jewel store to the jewel store owner's credit. They get it. He got into a shootout with them and they they ran away and then they commandeered a UPS driver's truck with him still in it, taken hostage. And they went out on the highway, got stopped by traffic. Police caught up to him and a shootout ensued in the middle of rush hour traffic and, oh, and uh, a bystander, the the hostage and the thieves they use other snapped. people's car like imagine you're driving and you're stopping <laughs> cop comes alongside of you using you as a human shield to shoot around you mm -hmm. going in reverse right there it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. not going to continue <laughs> yeah. roll down your window and duck. <laughs> <laughs> so like so the cops incentive is not so much to the people that are paying their paying them because uh, they're forced to they don't have a way to unsubscribe uh, and so the cops can't measure their measure of success. Like another you know, private venture would be like the number of subscriptions to their services, right? The only way they can measure their success is the number of tickets they've given, um, the number of people they've uh, put in jail. And mm -hmm. because they're not a real business, they can't use the real metrics that a private interest group would. Do we have too many cops? Have we, you know, uh, the subscription rate plan in, in terms of the profit would uh, relay their successfulness and their demand for their well, value. Yeah, David Freeman points out that the cost of war is so high that these security forces, these private security forces would rather, would be more inclined to do something instead of go to war with each other right, all the time. Right, right. Because it's sense. just, you're dead, you know, and that's a long <laughs> time. <laughs> There's an interesting yeah. note in um, the Prince, the Machiavelli wrote, that uh, he hated mercenary armies, private armies hated them because none of them will ever actually uh, kill each other. Uh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> they just want the money. <laughs> right. They, they want to engage uh, and then they back off. Uh, it was too costly, you know, because they have to pay on in case one of their own soldier dies and they all had like reciprocal kind of agreements in the way. <laughs> Uh, so they won't engage or do this stuff, but they wouldn't go full out That's to destroy each other. Situation. Which well, is why he advocated for a national <laughs> government with the state army to, to kill. Versus. Well, this is why they also take over the education system and turn it into a schooling system so people won't question. and right. Indoctrination system. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, <sighs> but yeah, David Freeman is a great resource. I'll link it uh, yeah, in the description later. Be good. Yeah. Um, the last topic I want to bring up would be uh, IP, intellectual property. Sure. And I look at it because um, Anne Rand was, was uh, very ferocious in making sure the philosophy is the philosophy. Uh, it's not like, did I mean this? And she's very, to her credit, great in being uh, clear and concise in that. Um, like the virtue of selfishness, that book, very clear and concise in the language. That's why she chose uh, Leonard Keat. Uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Leonard Peikoff. Peikoff, all right, to, to follow that because he did a good job in doing that too. Um, so she was, uh, to my understanding, against people trying to change her language or what she means by certain things. I think uh, with for her, she, she was okay with people having different opinions than her as long as they didn't say that it was objectivism. Right. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, you know, so, so, I mean, there, there were, there were what, what, what had been termed schisms in the movement, which is basically some people have decided that, well, maybe, maybe this is what objectivism means. And, and she would say, no, I mean, 
objectivism how I defined it. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, so, so, it, you know, and there were, and there, you know, so there, there have been some breaks over the years, but, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, some of those have continued to go on saying that what they're advocating is objectivism. Mm-hmm. For example, David Kelly and, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, Nathan, uh, uh, Brandon, um, he's, he's, Brandon. No longer, he's, he's no longer with us, but, uh, uh, I, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, especially with Nathaniel Brandon, it's interesting that, that, you know, he's claiming to be an advocate of objectivism while at the same time attacking it, but, <laughs> but I mean, you know, and, you know, with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, Kelly, uh, he had a difference of opinion on, on, um, uh, I guess making moral judgments and, uh, but he still wanted to say that his, his was objective and what is open objectivism, you know? <laughs> so, you know, like I said, it's fine for him to have his own opinion, but he should just call it something else. Right. <laughs> um, but I found one thing though, in her writings though, that she wasn't clear on okay. and that would be the definition of property. Cause I find that, uh, she has many ways to describing property, many ways to describe like it's a value of like a human mind, for example, in this knowledge as uh, as private property. But I found I, I can't I mean, you can help me unless I've, I've, I've looked for an exact definite definition of what is then property. Uh, and I think from there, there's been a lot of uh, discussions now right on intellectual property, uh, because it begs the question to say that it's property without having actually to define then what is property? I see. All right. Um, well, property is what happens when you use your mind and your, your physical self really to create something of value. And when you create that, it's yours. I mean, and, you know, getting very rudimentary, if you look at say, um, someone living in a, in a, in a, uh, a backwoods somewhere that's that's not say part of any government or whatever um that would basically amount to um making use of the resources that are available and if you you know fence it in build a house plant some crops basically that's yours i mean that's your property right and if someone comes in and tramples on it uh, tries to move into your house that sort of thing um you're fully justified in defending your property so i i I'm not sure where the confusion is on property, but uh, another interesting way to look at it too is is all all property is intellectual property because um, first it takes somebody with a brain to think of uh, a way to make use of some natural resource, um, and uh, you know that's in, in its most basic uh, sense. Looking at it, uh, that that is intellectual property. Now. The part with the intellectual property that to describe, because yeah, I have it here that she wrote down all properties, intellectual property, because human values are the product of the human mind. Uh, and the human mind, which she's referring to is like our, our thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, if our thoughts though are not as real and tangible as uh, like this table or this computer. Um, because they're not, they're not physical. Right. That's what you're at. Right. So I look at uh, defining then as property as being something that is a, uh, real, tangible, and scarce. And from there, we can define property rights. Uh, because uh, if things were not scarce, then uh, you know, we wouldn't really interact with each other. Right? Everything would right. be so infinite. Yeah, right. We don't we, we have no competition. Um, and the real and tangible part of it is uh, the aspect of which where we can uh, t- trade, right? We can actually trade with, with these sort of kind of products and goods. Um, whereas where our mind um, if I were to share a piece of information in my mind to Kurt, uh, it's not scarce anymore. Uh, and that he can, it's infinite. It's like a fire, so, right? It can spread. It's, 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 right. it's easily replicable. Right. And when, if he uses the information I gave him and he created it with his own resources, uh, he hasn't stolen from me because that's generally where this stuff will go to. It's like, well, you stole that from me. It's like, I can't steal thoughts from you. Um, in a way, right. If I, if I didn't want anyone, I guess to copy my thoughts, I wouldn't share it with anyone. Right. Uh, but it now becomes, uh, no longer rivalrous, scarce, it's infinite because now he has the information and he can also now do what he will with that, uh, the data. Well, okay. Let's look at it. So, so if you, um, 
for example, if you wrote a book, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what if he took that book and erased your name, put his name on it? What would you, would you consider that? Oh, so that falls under uh, fraudulent. So like if you wanted to buy this you're book from me, yourself. Right, if I, you're buying the book and the, you're going to give me $20 on the condition, I'm telling you that I am the author of this book, right? right? So you give me the $20, I give you this book, but you're getting, buying the book if the contract is, is on the condition that I am the title ownership, I, that I wrote this book. Okay. Uh, so we change title of the book and of the money. You find out that I didn't write the book. So I just committed fraud, right? I stole your, took your, stole your money. Okay. Now, how is that different from say doing that with say the idea that's in the book? That's the, that's the rub because I, I would think that, uh, it's like you mentioned the building the house on the new land, except how did I build that house? Well, I took, I, I memorized a blueprint that somebody else, uh, some architect out there had drawn up and, uh, I took that and just said, okay, well, I'm going to build that, that house, even though he really sells that to other people. I just looked at it and then, you know, built, went ahead and built it. So there was an idea there that was taken, but yeah. could you really say that, well, he now owns your house. Well, part of, <laughs> yes. And, and part of, um, intellectual property right protection is, 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 um, is more of a, um, an expression of respect for the originator of the idea than it is for, um, say like the tangible side of things that you would look at on, on a material, uh, possession. It's, um, I, and I could agree with and, that. And, I, yeah. and that, that's why, that's why there, there is right. latitude in that. And, and as far as defining it, like the number of years and, and this sort of thing, and it's like, it's like something that, okay, as a society, if we want to get together and we want to encourage um, the development of new intellectual ideas and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing and application of those ideas, then, then we should, um, allow the person who originated the idea to realize some rewards from his efforts, right. Rather than say, okay, well, the next guy is going to copy your idea and, and right. get all the profit while well, you spent decades laboring away at it, you know, even if it's, if it's, uh, right. mental labor. And I, I think, um, I, so I don't think it's, it's necessarily, it's, I, you gotta be careful not to get too rationalistic about it. Um, that, that it's like, there's some platonic ideal of intellectual property. Uh, I think it's, it's just that kind of an acknowledgement that this is something we want to respect yeah. and reward in, in a civilization that we want to live in. And, and how yeah. do we, how do we practically well, put the, the go-to example, I think is, uh, you think about Carlos Mencia, he's famous for copying other comedians and stealing their material. And he's gone. I look at it like the market worked against mm -hmm. that guy. They shamed him. They uh, said, you're a fraud. And mm -hmm. uh, like Joe Rogan called him out live in front of an entire audience one yeah. time. Well, and this would be kind of the same thing, but it, uh, and just in a more formalized way. You know, I mean, it's just it's just like you have you, maybe if, if it's, say, an anarcho-capitalist system, then you just do it with with the, the different agencies that would be involved to, to negotiate those things. But it's, right. I, I don't think intellectual property is really um, a problem. I think it's just it's, it's just a, a, a way of looking. You have to uh, just not look at it too rationalistically. Um, you know, it's, it's not like it, it's just like rights in general. They don't exist in reality independent of human thought. I mean, you're not you're not they're not they're not intrinsic and they're not um, they're not subjective and they're not like given to you by some some mystical being somewhere it's 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 rights uh arise from an environment where humans want to work together in a civilized way and not be at each other's throat all the time it's like it's just it's basically an agreement you know to live a certain way with each other and and, and then a formalization of that through whatever mechanisms make the most sense well it's, it, and it's not to commit to say a minarchist government situation versus an anarchist anarcho-capitalist situation would we'll just say the, the objective is to to uh, you know make that uh as as efficient as possible right. right there's um there's an area where uh duty to respect the authorship or the person who originated these ideas um and I think like John was pointing out, there's ways where the market solves that. There's one in which there's an artist that took paintings and took photographs and painted it. 
and then we'll sell it and had it up in the galleries. And then he's claimed that he was the original author of this stuff and never copied. But then we, somebody was walking through these museums and our guy was like, that's my work. I've took these photographs. This guy was banned. Uh, and they found out they out of the museums, out of all the gallery art shows, because uh, that would be considered like plagiarism. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can have these agreements as students, like not to plagiarize. And an anarcho capitalist society can have agreements that I will give you uh, this software or this information on the condition on the contract that you don't uh, copy it and share it with others. Um, right. Right. Uh, so you can have that, but it doesn't apply to like person C who is not uh, privy to that contract and happens, you know, versus you are to take a look and see what you guys are talking about or try to read lips or something. Um, I don't think that uh, copyright uh in the, under the government uh creates this thing of people feel like they have a right then to profit right uh a right to money because they've created this uh intrinsic object or pattern of information that's what it is pattern of information in which they feel they're obligated to have a right to other people's money and they have to give it to them i think it's well, a, i mean if it's a voluntary exchange situation no one's obligated to give them any damn thing right i think what they should do is just create a good business plan to market it and or don't put it out there until you have a good business plan. Well, sure. And the, and the concern, though, is is that someone else is going to um, take your idea. Yeah, that's what happens. And, yeah. and, and but, uh, but in the modern out. culture, we have the Internet so you can shine the biggest amount of sunlight than ever before. So you can you usually have first markers mover in terms of original ideas, in terms of products and things like that. I mean, you create something, you generally have like a domination of the market in those regions for a long time. Um, sure. But if you look at like communists advantage. and everything, they argue that, oh, nobody, like everything is built on the ideas of the people that existed before us. Because if it weren't for the roads that the government builds, you wouldn't be able to have a business or whatever. Right, yeah. right. So we all live on the ideas of the people that live before us, but it's well, not because of force. It's because those people yeah. felt it was more beneficial for them to build better things. Well, the whole, the whole point of accumulating knowledge is, is, is that you, you, you increase that, that body of knowledge generation over generation and improve, improve the human condition that way. But, um, <clears throat> like I said, it, 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 as far as intellectual property, again, I, I say, I think it's more of a matter of, um, just if people would agree that they want to reward that in, in, in a society that they live in, I think, I think that's the way that yeah. it should be looked I think, at. I think not, if you not as some sort of like, you know, absolute that 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 you got to pin down somehow it's just it's just a it's just how do you how do you want to address it and yeah. and you know deal with it and and and, and, this, and, and i mean you side. think of the different store, stores that you like and you think uh oh i hate uh mo's but i love chipotle and they make the same damn thing but uh the, you know, people can become really loyal to one or the other. And if it turns out that somebody lied to you and that wasn't a real Chipotle, like they have a fake Apple store in China, it's like, that's not real. And yeah. then you feel like you got gypped. You know, right. So. right. There's yeah. tons of uh, uh, like the fashion industry doesn't copyright because fashion changes every week. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there's an interesting story that because um, I went to the Wright Brothers Museum and I just borrow the history of it. As I'm reading about it, I come across some um, interesting information about them. Like one of the first letters wasn't really to like explode to the role that they created the airplane it was to the lawyer to patent the uh, the invention. Uh, and then when you hear about like what kind of stuff did they do afterwards uh, after they created the plane? Uh, they came, they, they spend the rest of their lives suing people <laughs> in America for creating airplanes in their backyard. I mean, they only <laughs> flew for what, like 17 seconds. Right. And that was enough for them to get. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for a copyright, I understand like respecting, um, the source originator or stuff like that, but through government, what government grants now is a government monopoly of force on anyone who tries to copy uh, your pattern information. Uh, and this is why up to leading to World War One, when you have the Great War and all these planes in the skies, America didn't have any because uh, they, <laughs> they had to pass a special legislation to override copyrights and in states of emergencies to kind of get permission to make their own planes. Yeah. Well, obviously, there's there's. Um, it's one thing to have an idea, like, uh, say, I would say the copyright would, would apply to making Wright Brothers 
planes the way they designed them, right? Now, as far as the rest of it, people can figure out the aerodynamics and, and so on um, and make a plane that's different, then that should not be that should not be something that the Wright brothers would be able to uh, sue them over. Right. I mean, I mean, they could try it, but I don't think they would, they should have grounds because, because this, they've taken maybe some of those ideas or maybe they developed independently, but they've, they've taken some of the ideas and, 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 and they've changed it. It's not no longer the same work. It's like it's the same way in music. Like if you, if you take a song that someone else did and you, you quote it in your song, but the rest of your song is different. I mean, it's not the same song anymore, you know? It's like the vanilla ice. Right, right. And, 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 and it's like no one sued them over that. I mean, because, because everybody knew, I mean, where they were, they were quoting another work, you know? As long as you acknowledge that you didn't originate it, mm -hmm. it's no fraud, mm -hmm. right? So, I, yeah, I think there's room for so, respect for authorship and all that stuff. I think uh, um, one thing that people do mention, they think that once they produce the idea, it's difficult to make some money, but that's not necessarily true. Like if I create like, um, like a, like this machine over here and, uh, I say, okay, here's the machine. Um, Tom, can you take it apart and make, make it like, no. Right. Yeah. You need, <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. It's it, taking you need a lot of people with uh, tacit knowledge and, and, and experience to kind of yeah. take things apart and replicate it. And by the time they figure out, like with medicine, I mean, you need years and the laboratory and all that stuff. By the time you figure it out, you can only produce a generic brand because they've already dominated the market with the first one that comes in, the first mover advantage. And I think for the most part, that's kind of how most of this stuff will go. Like you create a book and then maybe a possible way to make money is, um, uh, I made, I made the second book. People might make copies. Of course, uh, if you subscribe and make an advanced payment, pre-order it, uh, I'll release it once you reach this, this certain amount and bam, you know, you can still make your money like crypto, you know, right. I mean, Bitcoin is considered the least innovative of the ones that are currently out, but it's got also got the most adoption. So right. it's because it was the first in. So. It's like, uh, uh, VHS tapes, there was all these like weird, crazy size kind of tapes that came out. Um, but it was already too late. Uh, most of the systems were already adapted for VHS tapes. And that's just the, the standard that, that came through first yeah. mover advantage. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, I find that in a way to kind of resolve a lot of this issue. If it's the issue of like to make sure that you're the first one to make it known that you made it, uh, like on the Bitcoin, the blockchain, you can publish like letters and, essays and whatnot and it's all time stamped like the first person who discovered the, they think the planet pluto mailed himself a letter so it could be time stamped through the post office yeah. to certify that he's the one who discovered it um, but nowadays it's a lot easier to do other alternative ways to time stamp um hmm. certainly um yeah i so you would you say that you think it should be okay for people to take uh say someone's book and make copies of it and sell them? If they didn't have a contractual agreement with the person to say not to, uh, it is their property. If they want to make copies to sell it, they right. can do it's it. Right, okay. So, That's so affiliate seller, marketing, so, right? So example, the seller says, okay, on the condition, condition you buy my books, you agree not to replicate them. Right, you can do that. Right. That's a contract. That's, right. Yeah. By mm -hmm. buying the book. Okay. Yeah. Then, right. And then, then, you, then your intellectual property is protected if you choose to protect it that way. Right. If so I, I if I'm, I find I'm it totally in the, on board with that. Yeah. All right. So we can, you can have that. Yeah. Um, if I if I'm like a guy who finds it on the street and makes copies and sells it, um, but as long as I'm not saying like I'm the author because then that's fraud and they can sue me. It's it's a weird thing because you find like uh, local businesses will do that in terms of like the name of their store and they'll sue anyone who has a similar name. Um, thinking they're robbing customers, but it also kind of demeans customers if they can't differentiate <laughs> <What's> <laughs> the, right, yeah. the real places that they like to go to. Right. Um, so that this is like trademark branding, uh, brandishment of uh, types of copyright. And I think kind of goes like today in a so much crazy place and like it prevents innovation at that point. Uh, like most, so much money is spent on uh, legal battle suits. Uh, you, you're like this round corner here is a copy, is a patented. Right. Other phones can't really have the same kind of specifications now. Yeah. Yeah. Harley Davidson yeah. has patented, the, tried to patent the sound that yeah. comes from the yeah. motorcycles. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you're a draftsman, you know anyway. it's a fillet. 
right? Yeah. And it's a fillet and people have been putting fillets on, on things for, well, actually that wouldn't be called round. It's a round and you, you, you people have been putting rounds on things forever. So, right. You know, it's a, it's a drafting feature. <laughs> right. <not> patentable. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so you got, you got to draw the line somewhere too. I mean, you got, you got to be realistic. Right. So that, but that's where <clears throat> all that money all that capital could have been better invested into making better products, hiring more people. Um, but as it stands, like the expenditures for like in the worldwide and the billions, it's been yeah. a legal battle. Since yeah, I'm sure there could be reforms in that area for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and of course it's no accident that anarcho capitalists have come to this conclusion that intellectual property is bad because of course, intellectual property really can requires a government to enforce it because uh, if you don't have a government, then who's going to, uh, who are you going to send after the people that, you know, violate these, these, uh, rights, these copyrights well, and trademarks? Uh, uh, see, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be a little bit apprehensive about saying that intellectual property right as, as such is bad. I mean, and we just talked about, say, for example, selling, selling your books, you know, um, with your own, you know, stipulations. I mean, is that bad? That's intellectual property. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, these are like non-disclosure agreements. You can have non-compete agreements. They're kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you sign this copy then the information that you learn at this workplace, you're not going to share with others or do anything with it for the yeah, next five I, years. I think if you say that, if you go, if you say that intellectual property is bad, um, you're kind of given, you're, you're, you're pretty much giving away the whole store. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I, you have to acknowledge that, that there is such a thing as intellectual property and people should be able to direct it to some extent. Right. But like the, the modern conception that we have yeah. as trademarks and copyrights and right. that I would, type well, of I would look at it as trade secrets. Right. I wouldn't look at it so much as intellectual property. Trade secrets. Like I'm not telling you the recipe for this product, right? right? Nobody else knows it. I'm not telling you how my business recipe and how to do this business is like, if it was so easy, everyone will have like all these multiple businesses running across. Like you go to a store, so many t-shirt companies, but not all of them are like uh, better than the other or making the same amount of money, even right. if they try. Right. Um, so I think just don't make it at all. Right. <laughs> I think trade secrets are good. Uh, and I think that's kind of what, uh, a lot of this kind of boils down to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, like I said, I just be cautious about, about how you speak about it. Um, you know, right. Make sure you're saying what you mean and mean what you say, because if you come out and just say intellectual property is bad, you're going to get a lot of people jump on you <laughs> because they're going to, they're thinking you mean that, that, People shouldn't have any any rights whatsoever to their to product to their intellectual right. labor. Right, it's usually a, a conversation to be had. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I want to sure. appreciate you coming out here on the appreciate, show. Yeah, appreciate being invited. <laughs> I know it's been a long time in the coming, and it's it was inevitable. Mostly because my my weekends are are usually indisposed out in out in the countryside. So <laughs> right, that's good. <laughs> I look forward to getting some of your other events on weekends too. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yep. Um, sure. So with that, those listening, uh, stay liberated. Get off my property. They can print legislation, but we can print guns. <laughs> <laughs>